Snap Judgment Studios. Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan and writer Josh Johnson are best friends who rarely agree on anything. On the new podcast called Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson, they turn their hilarious, unpredictable, and legendary office banter into a war of words about topics big and small, mostly small, from texting versus calling to club bangers versus conscious rap and everything in between. Listen to Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson from The Daily Show every Thursday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. Snap. Often on Snap Judgment, we like to bring you the tale behind the tale. And today is no different. It's a story behind an infamous and disturbing photo, one that almost definitely you've seen before. It begins with a family that was separated by land and by sea, but stayed close with emails and phone calls. Always my phone call with my family, always in my kitchen, because I wake up early. My kitchen has a door to the, my uh, terrace, kind of, to the backyard, and I smoke. I always have my coffee and a smoke and talk to my family. Early morning in Vancouver is early evening in Kobani, Syria. So in both places, the light is soft, birds are chattering. When Tima got married, she left her whole family in Kobani a small town in northern Syria. Her mom, her dad, her sister and brothers. So she would call home almost every day. And a few years ago, she was waiting on news from her little brother, Abdullah. He was about to have a baby. So Tima was nervous, calling and texting him all the time. And finally, her little brother Skyped with happy news. He'd had a baby boy named Alan. And I remember I saw Alan for the first time. He was sleeping in Abdullah's lap. But uh, Ghalib was sitting beside him and... Uh, Ghalib was Abdullah's toddler son. He was jealous little boy that uh, he was telling Abdullah, where did you buy this boy, this baby from? And Abdullah, he said, we bought him uh, from the market and it cost me only one lira. And Ghalib would say, well, let's go and return, uh, get our refund back. And then Abdullah, you know, we were laughing When did you first realize how bad the war was? I started to get worried when uh, I heard uh, from my family it was uh, a suicide bomber in my uh, uh, neighborhood. So that's when they start leaving one by one. Abdullah went to Istanbul to find work. Rehana and the little boy stayed behind. It seemed safer that way. In Istanbul, Abdullah got a job at a woman's clothing factory. But it was really hard to find a place to stay. It was hard to know whether or not to bring the rest of his family over. And Tima was getting these phone calls from him on her back porch and feeling more and more helpless. So again, you know, I'm just a hairdresser, not really rich person. And I phoned them. I tried to do my best. I sent them money. But I could not understand why they're not getting the help they needed as a refugee there. A lot of people in her family had fled to Istanbul by now. And she kept asking on the phone, why don't you go to the UN? Why don't you go to a charity? This is crazy. Which my family, of course, they went to the UNHCR and they were overwhelmed and they told them, we cannot register you. 
you should go to the city and find your way, help your own self, basically. The UN just turned them away and said, we can't, we, we can't do it. Is that yes, right? yes. She kept pressing Abdullah and the rest of her family to try and get more help. And they kept saying, you don't understand. We're doing everything possible. And then at one point, Tima got kind of fed up and she scraped together some money. I decided to go there and I thought, you know, I could do something and help them. I could reach out to the UN. I could uh, reach out to organization or set up uh, to help the refugee there. Of course, when she got there, she faced the same problems her brothers had. The UN was overwhelmed. There were no magical charities giving away apartments or even really food or clothes. At one point, she took one of her nephews outside and dragged him from house to house, explaining the situation and pleading with strangers for help. Most people shut their doors on her. A day later, someone did come and give them some blankets and pillows. One night, she and Abdullah heard ISIS had invaded Kobani. And that's when they knew. It was time to bring his wife and his two boys to Istanbul. Abdullah has a day off. So she and Abdullah went shopping for some basic kid stuff. We went to that flea market. Uh, so mostly was clothes, toys, and um, some other dishes. Um, I remember one person, he has like lots of baby clothes. And I come and I hold this uh, short and the red shirt. Uh, I, I just fall in love with this red T-shirt and the short. I bought it for one lira. When Rehana got to Istanbul with little Gralib and little Alan, they didn't know where they'd all sleep. But Abdullah's boss at the factory said they could all sleep there, at the factory, on the floor. And he said, you know, they had um, some material, you know, old material. They put it in the, in the floor, in the cement floor, to make it, you know, a little bit warm for them. Uh, so uh, they were living there li- uh, at night, and then at 7 a.m., uh, Rihanna and the boys, they will pack themselves and go to the park until Abdullah at 7 p.m. finish his job and go and collect them and come back again to this factory. I come back here to Canada, and um, and I decided I need to help my family, but I don't know how to start, where to go. Once she was back home in Canada, Tima just thought she'd attack the problem from the West. Using Western resources and Western sympathies, she would bring her brothers and their families to Canada. So every day, of course, for a months and months, filling out those applications, you know, I get help from my neighbor. The mostly, mostly what Canada required, a valid Syrian passport, which majority of the Syrian people did not have a passport to begin with. Some people in her family did have passports, but they had expired. And of course, the little kids didn't have any passports. ISIS had already invaded Syria by the time Alan was born. How, I asked my family, can you renew your passport? And they were like really upset, like how are we gonna renew that? What, they want us to go to the war zone to actually renew our passport and come back again. Tima carefully filled out the application anyway, even knowing she didn't have all the required documents. Even the hand signature for the application, I mail it to them, they signed it by hand, and they return it to me. Tima also went in person to her MP, who hand-delivered a signed letter on her behalf to the Canadian Minister of Immigration. I waited. I never heard anything. I tried to call in the immigration office. I contacted every church across Canada. If they are hearing me now, they will remember me. I remember one day I phoned Abdullah and I said, uh, you were right. There is no way you can come to Canada. And he said, we know that. So why you are so stubborn and trying to challenge um, the government for something he can't even do. So Abdullah thought maybe they should try to make it to Europe instead. They saw Europe. um, They are, you know, taking refugee. 
And the only way to take it, it's you have to cross the Mediterranean Sea. There's another way, a river crossing between Turkey and Greece, the Ervos River. The water is cold and fast. But one morning, Abdullah went there, to the banks of the Ervos River, and he began to wade in. But as soon as his feet hit the cold water, he thought, this is crazy. And he turned back. He went back to Istanbul to try and find another way out. And Abdullah keeps saying to me, if you really trying to help us, would you consider to pay the smuggler so we can go to Europe? You know, I, I was happy, whatever it make you happy and your family. Then again, I sent him the money, $5,000. Snap Judgment continues in just a moment. Stay tuned. Welcome back. When we left, Tima Kurdi, her brother in Turkey, was asking her to send money, money for a smuggler, to get his family to Europe. Snap Judgment. I was happy, whatever it make you happy and your family. Then again, I sent him the money, $5,000. Abdullah took the $5,000 and started looking for a smuggler. The first thing he did was move his family from Istanbul to the port town of Esmir. When they got there, there were thousands of other people looking for smugglers. Abdullah and his family were planning on sleeping in a park, but it was packed with all these other refugees also looking for smugglers. So Tima paid for them to get a hotel room. I text my brother and I said to him, where are you? And he texts me back and he said, well, I am in the market here in Esmir. The first thing I need to do is to buy a, a life jacket for my family. And then he, he texts me another one and he said, how would you know uh, which one is fake, uh, which one is not. Because he was reading in the news. There is lots of fake jackets, so people should be careful. And I said, Abdullah, I don't know how can you tell from the fake or not, but how about how, how about if you pay the most expensive one? And this is how he decided to buy um, the expensive one. Do you remember where you were when you were having that? Were you in your home? I remember it was around 6 a.m. my time. I was at, at home in my kitchen. Was it, I mean, that's just such a dissonance for you to be home in your kitchen talking to your brother about tying life jackets onto your nephews. I mean, uh, how many times a day were you like, I can't believe this is my life? Well, it was actually, this is my life uh, become since the war started, since my family flee uh, Syria. It was every single day. This is my daily life. Back in Esmir, Abdullah's next task was to find a smuggler with a safe boat. So Abdullah said to me he find a few smugglers there and everyone will tell them a different price. But also from the day one, Abdullah, he said to me and and uh, he refused to take um, the dinghy, um, whose uh, people, they will be like 40 and 60 people in a big one. He want to make sure because um, his uh, kids are uh, young and he want to go with the better one. There is um, it's like a fishing boat, a hard fiberglass boat, and you pay extra, it will fit only a few people. And this is from the day one, Abdullah insists to take that kind of boat. But, um, you know, time play with them and the the situation get uh, hard and, you know, they don't want to lose the money spending it on just a basic food there and the hotel. Can you explain how come it couldn't just happen the first day? How come it couldn't be that they like went to this place? found a smuggler that day, and crossed the same day. Why Why were days and days and days passing until it was a month? Because um, the smuggler arranging for many, many other uh, refugees. 
So every day, every night will be maybe five boats will leave. And one time he went and he saw about 60 people and he refused to go. And he said to the smuggler, I'm not taking it because I have young children. We are carrying them. I I cannot do that. And uh, So was the situation that like, there were opportunities, but every time it just didn't seem safe, so he, he backed yes. out? Is that what was happening? Yes. I remember I wake up one day when I had um, a text message from Abdullah saying, we're leaving tonight. Uh, pray to us. Pray to God we will make it. So uh, I phone. I tried to phone Abdullah. I tried to text him, but I can see from WhatsApp message that uh, Abdullah last seen uh, online a few hours before. Abdullah and Rihanna had woken up the boys in the pre-dawn hours. They were groggy and sleepy. Abdullah told them they were going to Europe. Ghalib asked if there would be cookies there. The family waded out in choppy water to a small fiberglass boat. There was at least one other family on the boat. But just offshore, the boat began to be tossed around by giant waves. The captain panicked and went overboard. And for a moment, Abdullah tried to steer the boat with one hand and hold Gralib with the other hand. But then everyone was knocked out. For a few minutes, Abdullah managed to hold Alan and Gralib in his arms above the water. Then he lost them. Sometime later, a rescue boat picked up Abdullah, and he pled with them to keep searching for his wife and his sons. It's unclear exactly what happened next, but Abdullah's wife, Rehana, and his two sons, Gralib and Alan, all drowned. And at some point in the early morning, a news photographer took a picture of a boy on a beach. So I remember sitting um, on the couch in my living living room and uh, I saw my husband um, come in to me and he's hiding the iPad behind him and he said to me, I don't know if you should look at this photo. So I stand up and grab the, the iPad from, from him and I scream and I was looking at that t-shirt and the short and the shoes. And I said to Rocco, my husband, I said, I know those clothes. This boy belonged to us. Everybody saw that photo of my nephew, Alan Kurdi, the boy on the beach. The following report contains some disturbing images. The pictures that you're seeing right now is the body of a small child. The boy's a body. photo of this boy in red shirt and blue shorts has been widely shared. These on images of Ilan Kurdi that have finally brought the tragedy home to people in Europe. When the photo of Alan went viral, donations to refugee charities doubled and tripled within 24 hours. Politicians in the UK announced they would resettle 20,000 Syrians, citing the photo. The Conservative Party in Canada lost the national election when word got out that they had denied Tima's application. A German refugee NGO bought a rescue ship and named it the Alan Kurdi. ISIS used the photo in its propaganda. Lupe Fiasco wrote a song about the photo. Tima never looked at the picture again. After that time, she saw it on her couch on her husband's iPad. Her little brother, Abdullah, now lives in Kurdistan, in Erbil. He does a lot of charity in his family's name, especially at refugee camps with kids. There have definitely been a lot of times when Tima has had to encourage him to keep living. She goes and visits him when she can. To be honest, um, just recently, three years later, when... I was in Arbil with my brother Abdullah for the uh, anniversary, uh, September the 2nd. 
I was uh, in Abdullah's house and um, he was telling me there is an artist who uh, draw that picture of my son and uh, give it to me uh, as a gift. He said to me the same thing that that picture, he could not look at that picture. I said to him, I said, Abdullah, I want to take your hand now and go to that room and we're going to take out the cover from that picture, even though for me I couldn't, right, for the last few years. I hold my brother's hand, we entered that room and we took that cover and both of us, we sat on the floor. Abdullah touched the picture I touched it with my hand too, and that's when we decided it's okay to look at it. It's okay to look at it. Thanks so much, Tina Curdy, for sharing your story with the Snap. You can find Tina's amazing book, The Boy on the Beach, on our website, snapjudgment.org. The original score that you just heard was composed and performed by Renzo Gorio. The story was produced by Anna Sussman. Oh, I know. I know, but don't fear, because the end of the story is never really the end of the story. Why? Because more storytelling magic awaits right now on Snap Judgment, the podcast. If you missed even a moment, there are more amazing stories. Get it wherever you get your podcast, snapjudgment.org. And if you dig the Snap Judgment, let your station know or leave a review. Please leave a review. It's the only way this system works. Snap was produced by the team that always keeps it real. Please say hello to the Uber Bruiser, Mr. Mark Ristich, Pat Masini Miller, Anna, Right Way Sussman, Renzo, Wrong Way Gorio, Flo Wiley keeps it 100, Shayna Sheely, she's at about 60%, Nancy Lopez, she keeps it, Liz Mack finds it, Eliza Smith ponders the nature of it all, Tail squeezes it to cot, Leon scrubs at Morimoto. My name is Don Washington. Even though this is not the news, no way is this the news. In fact, you could argue with that guy giving you weird looks in the coffee shop only to realize there is no guy, only a thoughtfully displayed mirror, and you would still, still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is WNY. See you.